Well, hello there. I'm uh, Joel Roselink. I'm an oral and maxillofacial surgeon from Manchester, Connecticut. And here at the uh, Seattle Study Club meeting here in the lovely Amelia Island, you know, Florida. Um, you know, there's lots of things that inspire us. And I think there's lots of things that don't inspire us. And what I'd like to talk about today is maybe one of those things that we see every day with our patients that really doesn't inspire us, but probably should. And that is um, our temporomandibular joint patients that come in with problems. You know, temporomandibular joint patients oftentimes uh, are very difficult for us to treat. And there's a number of reasons why we don't like to treat these kinds of patients. But I think we should, because dentists uh, are the primary person to take care of patients' temporomandibular joint problems. So why don't we like to take care of these patients? Well, number one, a lot of times the diagnosis of these patients can be very difficult. Uh, but that really shouldn't be, shouldn't be the case. Patients sometimes are very difficult to manage. They have pain, they have fear, they have associated issues that cause some of their temporomandibular joint problems. So that's an issue to deal with. Treatment modalities can vary tremendously with the different philosophies of the dentists and the practices that they're in. And also many times these are very demanding patients that take up a lot of your time and often the financial compensation really isn't adequate for the amount of time and effort that you put into these patients. That being the case, to kind of make this a simple kind of a presentation in this short period of time that we have, I just want to distinguish two areas of temporomandibular joint dysfunction. One is myofascial pain, and the other would be true temporomandibular joint pathology, and it's very important to distinguish between these two issues. If a patient has myofascial pain, they have extra articular dysfunction, muscle problems, spasms. If they have true intraarticular problems, they've got disc or anatomical issues or some type of disease process that may go beyond the treatment, the conservative treatment that most patients with TMJ problems need, okay? So I think that that's important. Sometimes there's also a combination of the both, both problems. When we talk about the internal components of the joint, okay, more often than not, we're talking about the articular disc within that joint, and you can have a number of different issues associated with that disc. It can be displaced, it can be reducible or non-reducible, it could have a perforation, it could have an adhesion where it doesn't move. The disc morphology over time can change for a number of reasons. And then you can have pathology within that joint space that would not only affect the disc, but the associated cartilage around the head of the condyle and that glenoid fossa. You can also have problems related to the hard tissue of the temporomedibular joint. The anatomical morphology of the condyle and the fossa, degenerative osseous uh, disease or processes that are going on. We're seeing tremendous numbers of patients with autoimmune disease, or rheumatoid arthritis, or connective tissue problems, which <clears throat> can affect all joints, not just the temporomedular joint. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can have fibrous or an uh, osseous ankylosis, and then obviously some tumors and some cysts, and all those things are kind of possible to have within the joint that really would need to be evaluated. Now, here's a perfect example of an anatomical specimen where you can see that the disc is actually anterior displaced and the articulation is taking place on the bilaminar zone, an area where there's a tremendous amount of nerves. This patient's going to hurt, and he may not be able to be fixed, or she may not be able to be fixed with some of the conservative treatments that we have. And I think that needs to be recognized early in seeing these patients. I think all patients deserve to be at least initially treated with conservative modalities. We know that the vast majority of TMJ patients will respond well to conservative modalities with a lot of these associated intraarticular problems, but some of them don't. So what do we do? We sometimes put them on splints, we put them on some physical therapy, we give them medications, and if those things are refractory, then we have to start to think about maybe some surgical options or other modalities to treat these patients. One of the reasons why I think dentists have a hard time dealing with these patients is they spend too much time on conservative treatment, not getting the result that they want, and not knowing where to send the patient after that period of time you know, goes by. So these are extremely frustrating patients, and we don't want to be frustrated. We want to get in, get out, or make the right referral so that the patient gets the most appropriate treatment in the shortest amount of time. So the conservative care that I think that most dentists seeing these patients initially should do would be to be able to treat those patients who say that their pain is kind of at an intermittent or a constant level that's greater than 3 out of 10. I think if it's below 3 out of 10, the typical analgesics are usually fine, and especially if it's an intermittent problem, 
kind of deal with what those issues might be. You may want to start those patients on some more anti-inflammatory medications, a little bit more potent. Or you may want to put them on a muscle relaxant. And there's a number of muscle relaxants on the market that seem to be very uh, appropriate. You know, today a lot of our patients have psychological issues and some other things. So on a low-dose antidepressant, that might be an appropriate adjunctive therapy to use also. So all these things are kind of important. You know, we know that splint therapy is always used oftentimes in TMJ problems. The NTI, the night guard, aquilizers, over-the-counter type uh, uh, mouth guards, equilibrations, minor or major equilibrations, orthodontic treatments, all these things are used in conservative treatment. But are they truly effective for an intraarticular type of a problem? And oftentimes they're not. Splint therapy oftentimes basically is used to deprogram the musculature and affect the proprioception. And that may have a benefit for the patient. But if you have a true intraarticular problem, there's no change in that joint space by wearing a lot of these appliances. So although the patient may get some modicum of relief, once that appliance is out, the same symptoms then recur. I think that that's very important to, to recognize. So when treatments are refractory on these patients that have these temporomandibular joint problems, I think that it's a time to refer those patients to somebody else if they're not doing well in your office with conservative treatment. So definitely at that point, send them to somebody who can do the appropriate diagnostic testing and then offer them the appropriate treatment that they need. So, when the patient comes to our office, where we do a fair amount of temporomandibular joint diagnosis and treatment, we have a couple of treatment modalities that we can perform in the office that actually are significantly beneficial for a lot of these patients. And they are pretty benign procedures. And I even categorize these as conservative treatments within a surgical modality. So we can give them some intraarticular injections of medication, pretty easy, or even local anesthetic, just insufflate the joint. We can do, and this is what our most common procedure is, is an orthocentesis, very similar to what the orthopedic surgeons do, where you can go into any joint space, you can irrigate that joint space out, you can put medication into that space, you can do some minor manipulation, and I think that that would be a benefit. If you feel you want to see what you're doing, which you can't do with an orthocentesis, we have arthroscopy that we can even do in the office with some of these very small arthroscopes, which we'll show in just a second. So these are the three in-office modalities that we have. The orthrocentesis is a minimally invasive office procedure. We typically do it with local, local and nitrous or some light IV sedation. Um, and the purpose of this procedure is to alter the joint space to wipe out or to, to flush out any of the contaminants that might be in there or the fragments of, of material that may have been break, you know, broken down. Uh, it insufflates the joint so it changes the anatomy of the joint. We can use medications, a variety of different medications, and even some therapeutic adjuncts such as stem cells or PRP, um, as well as a Hyligan, which is a lubricant type material, or steroid within that joint space to help uh, initiate some reparative or regeneration of that joint. Um, and then we can also um, vigorously manipulate that patient because they're anesthetized, even though they're awake. They're, so that we can start to break up any adhesions that they might have also. I have a rule, and I'm not quite sure if it's my rule or it's a rule that I've just learned over, over the time, is, and that is with temporomedial joint problems, about 60% of the time, regardless of what we do, we see some benefit to those patients. 20% of the time, they're the same, no better, no worse, and then 20% of those patients need, need further treatment. So I always prefer to start with conservative treatment, the orthrocentesis, and then see if they need anything that's going to be more substantial. The orthrocentesis is a really nice procedure that sometimes maybe the general dentists aren't that familiar with. So let me kind of briefly kind of show you what it, what's involved. We basically use a two lumen trocar, kind of like a Y type of a very probe needle with two lumens in it. And what we're able to do is after we prepare the patient, local anesthetic into the joint, and a procedure that only takes between 10 and 30 minutes, um, that's what we basically tell these patients that we're gonna be doing for them. So here's our tray setup. You can see we've got some uh, irrigants that we're gonna be using. We've got some medications that we're gonna be placing into the joint. We've got a marking pencil so we can mark the patient. Uh, kidney basin to capture some of the uh, uh, outflow and the irrigants that we're gonna be putting into the joint. Sometimes we can even do some diagnostic studies of that irrigant to see if there's any other 
um, issues going on with those patients. And this is our basic trace setup. So here we have a patient just already anesthetized with some light IV sedation and some local anesthesia. And we're going to kind of show the procedure you know, as we're doing it in the office. And what we're doing now is we're taking that Y uh, orthocentesis trocar, placing it into the superior joint space, and we're kind of going back and forth trying to break up any adhesions, open up that superior joint space. And once we feel we're in a good comfortable position, then we're going to start to inject some of the fluid through that, that inflow catheter into the joint space. It comes out, out of an outflow catheter, and here you can see all the uh, material coming out of the joint that we're flushing through there. If you could see this a little bit closer up, you'll see that there's fragmentations that automatically are kind of coming out because oftentimes there is some breakdown and there is some degeneration within that joint. We like to do about two to 300 cc's of fluid to really flush out that joint, get rid of any chemical mediators. Once we have that flushed out, then we simply take the medications that we feel we want to apply into the joint, and in this case, it's just going to be some steroid initially. And my protocol at this point is to inject about one cc of steroid into the joint and let it sit for about five minutes. This allows some of the anti-inflammatory effects to take place without any prolonged damage that might affect the joint after this first orthocentesis procedure. After we've injected the material into the joint, then simply all we do is flush that material out, and then we'll put in any other definitive materials that we'd want to put into the joint space itself. And at the end of the procedure, what we do is we now have the patient open and close their mouth. We try to really extend their range of motion as much as we can, because it's important at this point to make sure that they've got good function that's different than the function that they had before we started. So measurements are always taken. So this is basically a first conservative surgical type procedure done in the office that, uh, that we feel gives patients tremendous amount of relief and gives us a good diagnostic indication of uh, how they're going to do in the future. If we feel the need to look in the joint and do arthroscopy, we do the exact same procedure, but in this particular case, we have an instrument that allows us to look through a, a, a camera into the joint. This is the on-point um, arthroscopic instrument, and here you can see it's got a video uh, display on it that, so we can actually see in real time exactly what's going on in the joint. We basically use a camera that's about 1.9 millimeters in diameter, and then this camera is protected by a plastic sleeve so we have as sterile an environment as we can within our office environment. And it's a very simple process to take that camera and inject it into or place it into that superior joint space, identical to what we just did for the um, orthocentesis, but now we have an opportunity to see uh, uh, adhesions or plications within the joint or see some synovitis or osteomalacia or chondromalacia within the joint. So we get a better idea of what the picture is going to be for this patient. Uh, this happens to be a disposable camera, so this becomes a little bit more of a procedure that involves a little bit more cost because of that disposable camera. If patients are refractory to orthocentesis, we're following an orthopedic model where we're trying to limit the amount of open joint procedures we do on patients, although that certainly is an option for a first surgical procedure, to go in to clean the joint out, to repair any uh, displacement of the disc or whatever would need to be done. However, if they're refractory to that, I thought it would be interesting to show you some of the things that we're doing in regards to total joint replacement for the temporomandibular joint. We have two types of total joint replacements, custom joints, which are matched and made for the individual patient, or stock joints, just like your orthopedic surgeon has when he goes off the shelf to replace your hip or your knee or your shoulder. So the, uh, the stock joint that we use is one from Biomet, and this is how the system works. It basically has two components. It has a fossa component, which is made up of a high-density polypropylene uh, material, and it has a solid titanium uh, surgical stainless steel condylar component. And here you can see how it's almost matched to look just like a normal joint. We're replacing the fossa and the condyle, and it's secured to the, uh, to the zygomatic arch as well as to the lateral border of the mandible but has full articulation, just like a normal joint would have. So how does this procedure uh, work? Well, for the appropriate patient, and here's a, an appropriate patient, 
who had a, a hemi joint done about 10 or 12 years ago. A hemi joint is just when we re replace the fossa component because the disc was removed, but now 10, 12 years later, more regener degeneration has occurred and more pain has started. So now we're going to take out this existing prosthesis and replace it with a total joint prosthesis. And because we don't want to put the patient through two operations, because in order to make a custom joint, you need to have a CAT scan or a pretty accurate cone beam in order to be able to make that, we elected to use a stock joint, which we can get right off the shelf. So here you can see um, the, the fossa component uh, on, that lower, uh, on that lower slide, and you can see some significant degeneration of the head of the condyle on this patient. So the way the procedure works is now we're going to go into this um, a patient in the hospital, and we're going to place intermaxillary fixation screws because we don't want to change the vertical dimension of the patient when we do this total joint replacement. So having that reference is critically important. So here you can see we have intermaxillary fixation uh, screws which will act to hold the occlusion together while we're doing the case. The case is a relatively straightforward procedure where we make a preauricular uh, incision. You can see where we make a submandibular incision and we're marking where the condyle on the fossa is. Here we've removed the uh, pre-existing fossa component and we've also done the condylectomy. And now we're going to replace the fossa. We make a second incision in the uh, submandibular region to be able to place the condylar component. Here you can see the condylar component is now articulating with the fossa. We secure everything with bone screws and make sure that everything is solid. We articulate the patient, making sure that the fossa component and the condyle are not going to um, dislocate in any way. Here you can see that ramus component and all the screws that are used to close it, uh, to hold into position. And this is our closure. It looks relatively you know, straightforward at the end of the surgery. And here's our patient four weeks later. Just to give you an idea, we put these patients into immediate function. Uh, she had a very limited opening before she started of about 20, 22 millimeters. And at the end of the procedure, about a month later, she's opening up to 30 millimeters. So my thoughts are that these are, there are many good solutions for many patients that have TMJ uh, problems. And I think it's very appropriate for dentists to, to embrace these patients know how to treat them conservatively, and if they don't have a good response, certainly get them to somebody who can then offer him the next level of treatment. So I think we should get inspired to treat some of these TMJ patients, and I want to thank you very much.